grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, happy birthday to all of you. Happy birthday to the church today. Today, in the giving of the Holy Spirit, the church was born. It's true. Before this day, all those years ago, the church had not been established. It was not yet alive and doing the thing that it was called to do. The Holy Spirit makes it all possible. All of the amazing things the church does and all the seemingly mundane and normal things like coming together into the same building and sitting in a pew and hearing God's Word and receiving His gifts. Not a very magical looking thing from the outside, certainly nothing strenuous unless you had to jog here from where you lived, although most of us don't do that. All of this is made possible by the Holy Spirit. A good example to look at is Peter. Before Pentecost, Peter had a few things attached to his name, none of them very flattering. Right? He makes the proper confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then from there things kind of go downhill. Very soon after, he tries to stand in the way of Jesus when Jesus says that he must go to Jerusalem, and he tells him to get behind me, Satan. Then in fear in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cuts off the servant's ear, again not knowing that Jesus must face the thing that was coming. And then, of course, he denies even knowing Jesus when he's facing scrutiny in the temple courtyard. Not once, but three times. But today, in Acts chapter 2, take a look at Peter. What a radical transformation has occurred here. He went from being a coward and being selfish to being somebody who preaches to a crowd of thousands of people. What happened? Did he become enlightened with some new skill or knowledge? No. He received a gift from God, the Holy Spirit. So do we. The Holy Spirit happened, and this isn't the first time that God has called His people and established His relationship with them. In fact, in the context of the Acts 2 reading, everybody is gathered in Jerusalem from every place on the earth, every nation under heaven, as the text says, to celebrate something that God had done similar to this before. They were there in Jerusalem celebra celebrating Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. This was one of the three pilgrimages that they took every year as an observant Jew to the city of Jerusalem at the command of God. This is why so many people are gathered from all over the place in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is given. As our text says, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. They were there to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. Now, the Feast of Weeks was established in the Old Testament, and it was the mandated seven-week counting of the Omer that began in the deliverance from their enslavement into Egypt all the way up to the time they are given the Torah or the law of God on Mount Sinai. And the counting was the expression of anticipation for the giving of this great gift. Because the giving of this gift changed their relationship with God. You see, on Passover, they were freed from their enslavement to the Egyptians. But on Shavuot, they were given the Torah and had become the people of God, a nation established by God, His very own people. Does any of that sound familiar? Well, it should, because our great deliverance and the establishing of what follows follows a very similar pattern. We just got through the Holy Week and we're ending the season of Easter today. Did you notice how many weeks of Easter there are? Seven. 
And what kicked off those seven weeks? Nothing but the great act of deliverance of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the freeing of slaves. Not slaves enslaved by some earthly power like the Israelites in the Old Testament, but all of us freed from our enslavement to sin and our inevitable death and destruction as a result. And then seven weeks of celebration follow, counting down to the giving of a great gift, a gift which changes the relationship of God with His people forever. After Jesus ascends into heaven today, the gift He promised is given, the very Holy Spirit of God. And now everything has changed, not just Peter who's been given a zeal for the gospel and a courage that he didn't have before, but for each and every one of us, from dead to alive, the cup has been filled, our purpose is now clear. Now the disciples can begin and we continue to carry on the tradition that we've inherited of going and telling about Jesus, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching everything that God has commanded. Only by the Holy Spirit can this be done. Only by the Holy Spirit can we be the church. And only by the Holy Spirit can we reach others with this message. If we look at a couple of the verses in our Acts reading today, we can see the truth of the Spirit working already. There are people gathered around that don't speak the same language, and yet they're hearing this message from the disciples in their own native tongue. And I'll read the list again, starting in verse 9. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing the Word of God to bear in the lives of those who hear it, and by His grace and His divine action, faith is born. Faith comes from hearing God's Word. And now the church has begun its work. And it continues to do its work this very day, using all of the same methods and gifts given 2,000 years ago. Again, I remind you to look at Peter. The radical transformation of Peter by the grace of God and the giving of His Holy Spirit going from denying Jesus three times, even knowing Him in a group of, a small group of people, to preaching boldly a sermon from the Scriptures about Jesus to a crowd of thousands. We don't know the exact number of people. We do know that 3,000 people were baptized as a result of this Word of God and the giving of the Holy Spirit that day. So it's likely there were even more people gathered And now Peter is standing in front of them preaching the message of the gospel in Jesus. Now, the first part of his message that is in our gospel reading today seems pretty easy to take. But the full part of his sermon is not the easiest sermon to preach. He, in effect, tells them that they've crucified the chosen one of God. So to go from somebody who denies knowing Jesus in the presence of a small crowd to preaching to a massive multitude of people, especially preaching them something true that they maybe don't want to face, can only be done by the Holy Spirit. Well, ever since this day, nearly 2,000 years ago, God has been generously pouring out His Holy Spirit on His church. You see, the Holy Spirit by nature is something we can't grasp or understand, and we certainly can't control it. And the reality of that is apparent in each one of our lives. How many of you know someone who doesn't believe and that you hope would believe? 
And how often do you get an insight from God when exactly that's going to happen? It turns out that's the work of the Holy Spirit and we don't have any control over it. We're a part of the process, as we'll see, but we can't grasp the Holy Spirit and make Him do what we wish. It can be frustrating. It can also be comforting because you can experience the work of the Holy Spirit that's happening without your knowledge that yields greater fruit than you can imagine. There are a number of times during the service I'll be listening to a song and I'll be thinking, man, that's perfect with my sermon, but it wasn't planned at all, at least not by me. Or when I'm shaking your hand as you leave church and you'll tell me, Pastor, it was so great when you mentioned X in your sermon, and I'll think to myself, I didn't mention X. So either you were sleeping and having a nice dream or the Holy Spirit was speaking to you for He knows your situation in ways that I do not. And it's by Him that you believe the words that you hear today from our Lord and Savior and from those He calls to spread His Word. But God's mercy knows no bounds, and so He doesn't leave the church simply with the giving of the Holy Spirit, and that's it. But He gives the church means, a means that are given for their benefit, means that we can see that we can taste, that we can feel, that we can hear. So that when we're involved in those gifts, we know the Holy Spirit is present doing the work of God, even though we can't see, grasp, understand, or control the Holy Spirit. In our theology, we call those the means of grace. Those means are the Word of God being read and listened to and preached. The gift of holy baptism where you receive the Holy Spirit when God places His name on you and makes you His own, and at His table where He gives the very body and blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice that secured your freedom from your enslavement to sin and that nourishes your new life in the Spirit of God. We still don't control them. I can't just do them however I want. And it would make my life a lot easier if I could. But God has given those for our mercy, through His mercy for our benefit. I can feel, I can taste, I can see, I can hear, I can remember when the water hits my head in baptism. And even if I was too young to remember, there were people there that witnessed to it about me. And then I have a certificate and a candle that remind me of that day and the promise that God gave me. I can taste the body and blood of Jesus as it becomes a part of my very body and in so doing sanctifies me and keeps me holy. And through my ears I can hear God's Word coming into my life in the midst of darkness and doubt and struggle and by the grace of God given in His Holy Spirit I can trust in those promises even when things don't seem to be going well. Dear friends in Christ, these are the same gifts we use today, and they were given nearly 2,000 years ago to the church. And in Acts chapter 2, we see all of these means of grace on display from the very birth of the church. The word is pretty obvious here, right? Peter is preaching God's word. He quotes the scriptures from Joel's, Joel and then expounds upon it as he teaches about what Jesus has done. Right, as he declares the mighty works of God, and all who are present can hear. And after they hear him preach later on in the chapter, it says they're cut to the heart. And they turn to the apostles and they say, what shall we do? This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can cut to the heart and draw us to repentance and faith in Jesus and then after the preaching of the word from Peter, and they say, what then shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we learn that 3,000 people were baptized that day. The word, holy baptism. And then after they're baptized, it says, the faithful gathered together, and they listened to the apostles' teaching they were diligent in prayer and in the breaking of bread and fellowship. Dear friends in Christ, those are all the things that we do when we gather 
even today here at Ascension Lutheran Church in the North Hills. We gather in fellowship, experiencing the blessing and joy of being together in the body of Christ. We gather around to hear God's Word read and preached from one called to do so. We receive the gift of baptism. In my great joy, I got to celebrate my son's baptism not even a month ago. But we each remember our own baptism every time we gather here, the promises of God given again and again as a reminder of the gift that you received when that water hits your head and the Word of God was spoken over you. And we gather around His table to receive His gifts that sustain us in our faith, in the promise of His death and resurrection and our redemption, and the sustaining of our new life in this Holy Spirit. You have inherited a rich joy, more than a mere tradition, but the very divine gifts of God given through the church. And all of this is made possible by the gift we celebrate today of the Holy Spirit. It enlivens our hearts. It gives us the ability to believe the Word of God come to us in Jesus and through His apostles. This is the core of God's people, the core of His church. And it is the thing that drives His mission and what now has become ours. To serve Him, to love Him, to worship Him, and to go and tell others of the mighty works of God. So we will continue to use the gifts that He has given us. The means of His grace which has transformed our lives just like they transformed Peter and the 3,000 people who heard the word He spoke and believed. Because by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, we believe what Peter says. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. People of God, go forth in the Spirit of God, a spirit of mercy, compassion, and zeal, so that many more people may hear of the wondrous love of God and His mighty works of salvation in Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen.